Welcome to the Truly Passive Income Podcast. I'm Neil. I'm flying solo today, but I am here with Amanda Hahn and Matt McFarland, CPAs and tax strategists who specialize in helping people use real estate to save massive amounts in taxes and keep their hard-earned money. So Amanda and Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. So let me start by asking you how you got into real estate. CPAs can have a varied background, but real estate is a little bit more of a specialized niche of it. Yeah. My exposure to real estate actually started with when I started my career at a big four accounting firm. It was, I just remember I was probably a couple of years in and my aha moment happened when I was reviewing a gentleman's tax return. and he was probably in his sixties. He was retired. He was investing in real estate and you're looking at his tax return and you add back to depreciation because he you has know, expense he's not paying for. And then you quickly realize that this 60 some year old, and this is 25 years ago, this person was making over $200,000 in cash flow as a retired 60 year old investor and not paying any taxes. And so that's when the light bulb went off for me that there was something there. And then when Matt, when did you, that was 25 years ago. So that was when you, yeah, this is like, off. this is 19. I started in 1998. That's probably a couple of years in. So maybe 2000, something like that. I was a senior. It was a couple of years into my career. And what about you, Amanda? I mean, on a similar note, add one of the big four, which is where we met. <laughs> and I happened to end up in the real estate specialty group. So my clients were all of the large real estate investment firms, developers, and things like that. And so yeah, what I did day in and day out, and Matt and I had a lot of overlap in our career at Deloitte because I worked on the real estate investment side and he was on the high net worth individual side. And those are the same same people usually, right? The business is real estate and the individuals, the wealthy individual paying taxes, a lot of crossover there. But we didn't really start investing on our own until many years later. I think like many people who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the first time that we thought, hey, we can do this too. It doesn't have to be just for our clients that we work on. So as I said, before we were starting off, our audience is primarily passive investors. What are some of the key tax benefits of investing passively in real estate syndication as limited partners and how can individuals maximize those benefits? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the first one that comes to my mind is I think People don't always look at it like this, but it's investing in real estate syndication is obviously the goal is for that real estate to generate cash flow. But a lot of times early on that cash flow is is sheltered by depreciation losses. You may get as a passive investor, you might get a distribution check of ten thousand dollars, but your K one's not gonna show ten thousand dollars of income. It might show zero, it might even show a loss. So I think that's one of the main benefits that people need to not forget about is when they're investing in these passive syndications that a lot of times they're getting cash flow and it's sheltered from taxes for at least the first couple of years for sure. Does the choice of legal entity, an LLC, LP, or S Corp affect how the passive investor's tax liability is and what factors should they consider when they're making that decision? Yeah, that's a great question. Purely from a tax perspective, it doesn't make a difference at all. One of the benefits of being a passive investor is that generally there's already asset protection built in, right? The property, the fund, the syndication is already in an LLC itself. On the tax side, we're not very concerned with needing another level of entity. It's uh, oftentimes that just creates more paperwork than necessary. Matt said the benefits that you typically see on a syndication investment, whether that's the fund maximizing write-offs or depreciation, cost segregation, they all come to the passive investor in a, a pretty package on the K-1, all wrapped up. So the investor doesn't even have to do anything in order to get that tax benefit on the King one, right? And so this is true regardless of whether the passive investor is investing in their personal name or in an LLC that they own. We even have investors who invest using their retirement account, like a self-directed IRA or 401k. And so in all those scenarios, basically what we get at the passive investor is a K-1 that already reflects all of the strategies on the fund level, which is reducing the rental income for tax purposes. Gotcha. Two I want to get to the IRA investing here in just a moment, but I want to follow, I want to backtrack just a bit and get you to explain a little bit for maybe who's somebody who's new to investing in real estate, how the depreciation works for passive real estate investments. Depreciation is kind of what we jokingly refer to as ninth wonder of the world. When you buy rental real estate, whether it's you're on your own or passive syndications buying the rental real estate. Obviously, the goal is for it to go up in value. It's to generate positive cash flow. But from a tax perspective, the IRS actually allows you to write off a portion of that purchase price every year as if 
because of normal wear and tear. So as, as if it's depreciating in value, right? Now, that depreciation is based on the purchase price. So it's not, a lot of times you'll see the syndications, they'll buy a $5 million property, but they've raised a million bucks. The depreciations calculation starts at $5 million, not the million dollars the investors put in. And so that's why I was talking, it's like a paper write-off where it's, it's maybe something the bank was paid for part or a good chunk of it, but you still get to write that off on the taxes every year against that positive cash flow. That's the way where investors, whether again, pass away through syndication or on their own, can use that depreciation to kind of offset the income from that property. Does it cross over into other assets that you own? I've often heard depreciation sometimes described as a bucket. You get a big bucket of depreciation and then when you choose to take it is often up to you. Is that correct? Um, it depends. So if I have a single family home, my own rental property, there is some control, not in whether I take depreciation or not, but there is some control over how quickly I take depreciation. For example, if I'm not able to use the loss or I don't really need the loss, um, I might just take regular depreciation. So meaning the building, I'll just depreciate over 27 and a half years, slow and steady. But if I'm someone who can utilize the upfront depreciation, I could do a cost segregation and accelerate that right now. So that's where our choice comes in, whether taking it in the normal sense or accelerating that benefit. With respect to passive investors of syndications, Unfortunately, the choice is not made by the passive investor, right? Just like with the investment decision, usually that is made at the fund level. So the sponsor group, the GPs are going to be the ones to decide whether we're going to take accelerate depreciation or not. Now, when the K-1 comes to the investor, that's where the strategy will come in. So let's say I was a passive investor and I got this great distributions and my K-1 shows a tax loss. I'm really happy. Now, the next question is, what kind of income can that K-1 loss offset? Is it just my other rental income? Is it other passive income I have? Is it my W-2 income? That level of planning is something that each investor should be doing with their own CPA to figure out when and how is the best way to utilize that benefit. Gotcha. And that was my next question. Is it possible to offset W-2 income with losses from passive real estate investments? And I know you're going to say it depends. So I'll just, we'll start there. Did you read the, did you read the sign behind us? It says it depends. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. There are ways that people can use passive real estate syndication losses to offset W-2 or other types of income. Generally, they do need to be qualified as what's called a real estate professional for tax purposes. And that that's going to require them to have probably their own properties, their own long-term rentals where they're spending time on those. But if they can qualify and they have that the right facts and circumstances, then yeah, they're investing on the side and these passive syndications that are kicking off K-1 losses because of depreciation early years. They can definitely use that depreciation in the right circumstance to offset their other income as well. Gotcha. But it's not going to work for a doctor or a lawyer or somebody who's not an active real estate professional, correct? Well, probably not in that scenario, but to change the facts a little bit, what if that doctor is investing passively in those deals and he's got their own passive real estate investments? You know, not a real estate professional, but they're just, you know, they've got their own rental properties and maybe those are showing positive income. They could definitely use the losses from the syndication to offset the income from their own rentals and thereby sheltering the taxes they were going to pay on those for sure. And we also see like if this doctor is married, right? Or, and so maybe they're still working full time, but their spouse is the one dealing with their own smaller portfolio of properties. And so, yeah, if the spouse is a real estate professional, she met the right number of hours on the real estate activities, then it is possible to also invest in syndications and use those losses against the physician income. We see that actually a lot. So a lot of clients, because to invest in most syndications, you have to be accredited, right? Which means somebody has either had a lot of assets or making high income. And what we often see is people say, oh yeah, I want to be a real estate professional. I want to have a bunch of rentals of my own. And then I'm able to use the losses against the, the income. But over time, people get fatigued, right? Like, okay, I had three rentals. It was great. Now I have six rentals. And then the next year I'd have 10 because I keep chasing that tax benefit. So this is where syndications work really well. Because if, again, like Matt said, if you're a real estate professional with your own portfolios, then you can always scale up by investing in more passive syndications to continue to get the tax benefit without creating a full-time real estate job for yourself. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So you wrote a book called Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. It's a very well-known book in the real estate community. 
And in your book, you discuss the use of self-directed IRAs for real estate investments. Can you elaborate on how individuals can leverage those self-directed IRAs to invest in real estate syndications while taking advantage of the tax deferred or tax free growth? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something, an area that a lot of our clients take advantage of. But taking kind of a step back, I think the way to look at it, obviously, people are, you know, they have retirement accounts, they're going investing, and most of the time people are investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, but it's not stuff that they can control. It's not stuff that they know necessarily. It's just putting in the hands of somebody else and letting whatever happens, happens, uh, which is fine, obviously. It's uh, But the way we talk to our clients about it is a lot of our clients, probably 85, 90% of our clients are involved in real estate to some extent. So they, that's their knowledge base, right? So we talk to our clients about looking at why not use your retirement account to invest in something that you understand and maybe to some extent can control. You have a better grasp on that market than the mutual funds, right? Now, whether you're, you know, you've got your money in your IRA already, whether it invests in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds or real estate, really comes down to where do you think it's going to get a better return on your money? That's one thing. And then again, clients seem to understand the real estate side of things work better. So that's why our clients like to use their IRAs or retirement accounts to invest in kind of alternative assets, as we call it. But at the same time, yeah, they're still, you know, they, they can still put money into the retirement account, potentially take a tax deduction when the money goes in. That money will grow tax deferred as it investing. And then depending on what type of account it is, when you pull it out, you may pay taxes or it may not if it's a, you know, if it's a raw. It's a couple of different ways to slice it and dice it, I guess. So one of the challenges I know you sometimes face investing in real estate with an IRA or any kind of retirement account is UBIT, unrelated business income tax. Income tax, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you describe, can you describe for people what that is and maybe some strategies for not getting hurt too bad by that. Yeah. UBIT is one of those quirky things in the retirement world where if your retirement account invests in certain types of assets, even though it's a quote unquote retirement account and it's supposed to be tax deferred or tax free, if it's investing in certain types of assets, then it may pay taxes along the way. So one example outside of real estate would just be like, I don't know, if your retirement account invested in a subway franchise or something, it was one of the owners that was it was a set up as a partnership and your, your retirement account was getting a K-1 because the, they were operating a business. That type of income in your retirement account, your K-1 would be subject to this UBIT tax. Now in the real estate world, uh, retirement accounts that they invest in what they call leveraged rental real estate, those are situations where the retirement account, if the rental property is kicking off a profit after doing the normal expenses and depreciation, if there was a profit, then their retirement account may have to pay a tax on the kind of the debt finance or the leverage part of that profit every year. If you buy a property of 500,000, there's a loan of 250, there's 50% leverage in that situation. So any dollar of profit that that rental property would make, the IRA would have to pay 50% of that would be subject to this kind of UBIT tax that you were referring to. Yeah, I think the one thing I want to add is a lot of people or a lot of advisors actually recommend or try to have people stay away from using retirement money for real estate. But something really important to know is that UBIT taxes is assessed on taxable income. So you can use things like depreciation and things like that to offset the current tax. So we really don't, in practice, that becomes a problem usually sometimes later on in the life cycle of an investment or upon the sale, right? When you have a property, you sell at the very end for a larger gain. But I think like Matt said earlier, it's really about comparing the total return on investment, right, after factoring in the tax cost, rather than just saying, never use retirement account for real estate. <laughs> yeah, that's often what I tell people is, oh, you know, I, I, I'll have to pay you a bit. And I'm like, do the math, there's depreciation, you're probably still going to end up with a better return than you might end up with investing in the stock market. It's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, that's exactly, you look at the math, it's like, hey, my return on investment was 5% in the stock market, in you know, mutual funds. And after, even if I paid you a bit in my IRA's return on investment was 7%, obviously you still came out ahead, right? Yeah. It's just people, sometimes people, they're overly tax sensitive. I don't want to pay any taxes at all. You're stepping over dollars to pick up dimes or what it is. So we, we've talked about depreciation, but at the end, when you sell an asset, a lot of times it's going to be subject to depreciation recapture, correct? Yep. And yeah. how, what, how are some ways that investors, especially passive investors, can plan for that, offset it? Talk to me. I think it's really important for investors, for even passive investors, to be aware and or dialed in into what the plans are with respect to a syndication asset. 
So if I invested in an apartment syndication and I know it's going to exit sometime this year, that it's a really good idea for me to do some tax planning with my own CPA, right? So for example, I'm expecting $80,000 capital gains from the sale of real estate. What are some of the ways I can reduce it, right? It, because that kind of planning is done at my level as an investor, the syndication is not gonna do the planning for it. A couple of different things to look at for those people who are passive investors, where not real estate professional, had not been able to use losses before, well, here's where the good news is that all those losses that you received from K1s in prior years can potentially be used to offset this upcoming $80,000 gain. Or if you're someone who has your own rental properties that are single family duplexes that are kicking off losses, whether naturally from depreciation or manufactured through accelerated depreciation, those losses can also likely offset the capital gains from the sale of a syndication asset. Yeah, I think people hear that term depreciation recapturing get scared and it is part of it is part of the overall capital gain on the sale of an asset. It, it is taxed slightly higher, generally speaking, than the regular long-term capital gains rate. But keep in mind, a lot of these, you probably see this too, right? Is a lot of these investors in these syndications are wealthy, high-income people in a higher tax bracket. So that upfront deduction they're getting probably is saving them at 32, 35, 37 cents of the dollar, where the depreciation cap from the back end is only at a lot of times 25%. So you're still coming out ahead in the right circumstances. But again, it's all part of that capital gain. So it all goes back to, at the end of the day, it goes back to the planning of how are we going to offset the overall capital gains? And it's going to shelter that and the capital gains. And what are some other things we can do from a timing perspective to reinvest money in here or there, whatever the case may be, whatever the planning strategy is. Yeah. We call it a lazy 1031 exchange. So if you invest in syndication number one that exits, well, you can take the money and reinvest in another syndication. And then the new, the second syndication kicks off losses within the same year, then they can offset each other or even harvesting stock losses. So if you had stock or crypto losses, those are capital losses that potentially offset the capital gains of the syndication too. So many great ways to offset or defer the tax that like I might say, you don't have to be super scared of this word, depreciation recapture, which unfortunately a lot of CPAs have that narrative. I was, it's funny. I was talking to a client yesterday and I mentioned the, this, that's lazy man's 1031 or it got translated from me saying lazy man to them saying poor man's 1031. I was like, I don't know if it's, it doesn't have to be a poor man's 1031, but yeah. Yeah. All right. So I want to learn more about what you're talking about there, but I want to reiterate something you said there as a key takeaway for people is that if you're in a syndication, uh, as soon as you know, there's going to be an exit, you need to sit down with your tax professional, your tax strategist and start planning. Don't wait until tax season to all of us go, oh yeah, I had three exits last year. What should we do? The first time we hear about it, it shouldn't be when you're sending me your K-1 in March or April, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we work with investors on both sides. We have clients who are syndicators and we have clients who are the passive investors. Um, and something we always tell our syndication clients are, is if you're planning an exit, make sure you let your investors know ahead of time so that they can be anticipating that we've even seen it where if a deal is very close to exiting at the end of the year, like middle December, then looking for ways to delay that gain, even just by a couple of weeks, because same thing, right? If we don't sell to the end of the year, the investor has almost no time to plan. But if we delay it by a couple of weeks, now they have all of the following year to try to plan for ways to offset the tax. Gotcha. That's brilliant. Not always possible to do. And if you're having a, uh, somebody trying to buy your syndication, but. All right. So we're, we're having a lot of conversations these days with 1031 people. And I know that one of the challenges with doing a 1031 out of a syndication is that you normally, you have to, the entity, you have to stay within that entity is let's say it's main street storage LLC. And then all the investors are part of that LLC. And then basically that they sell and they ask everyone, Hey, do you want to move on to a 1031 exchange? If they don't, they buy out the people who don't, but the people who do, they, then that asset goes ahead and buys another facility, another property as a 1031 exchange. But beyond that, it gets very, very tricky to my understanding. And I'm certainly no 1031 pro getting your money into a syndication via a 1031 exchange gets really complicated because you're having to deal with ticks, tenants in common, you're, you got to replace the debt. And, but so talk to me about the lazy man, 1031. This sounds very intriguing to me, not the poor man's 1031. 
Yeah, to your point, with syndications, those situations can be difficult because there'll be times where, yeah, that Main Street Storage LLC has got 50 investors and 20 of them don't want to continue investing with Main Street Storage LLC. They want to cash out and move on with their lives, right? Sometimes to accommodate that, maybe maybe let's say Main Street Storage decides we're not, we're just going to sell, we're not going to do 1031. So all the investors get K-1s with capital gains on it. Maybe those investors that wanted to, say, continue investing and didn't want to pay taxes on the gain, what they could do is take that money, that distribution they got from that partnership, and before year end, go and invest in maybe another syndication that's going to do a cost segregation study to generate accelerated depreciation, kick off losses to that that investor. And then they've done in the same, they've timed it right in the same tax year. So they've got one K1 with a large loss, one with some gain. And maybe if the numbers work out, they've offset each other t- for to the most extent. So how can passive investors take advantage of the tax benefits offered by opportunity zones? And what should they look for when evaluating potential investments in these zones? Yeah, the, the way the, uh, you know, so to your point, the Opportunity Zone only came out, I think, at the end of 17 or something. So it's only five, six years old. That's part of the reason it's totally brand new, never existed before. But the way an investor takes advantage of it, they've got to have, they've got to have a tangible recognition event, generating capital gains from something. They're selling stocks, they're selling a rental property, they're selling a business. Or exit from one syndicate. Yeah, some. So they've got capital gains income that they're looking to. I don't want to pay tax on it right now. So I reinvest that into a qualified opportunity zone investment. It could be a syndication, could be their own for that matter. But something that, you know, the syndication is going out buying an asset in an opportunity zone. The benefits to the investor are basically twofold is they've been able to defer the taxes that they would otherwise have to pay on the front end. And they can defer and that, you know, they have to basically come due with the taxes in 2026. Six years ago, this is a longer deferral period. Now we're a little bit shorter, right? But the benefit is still there that they can defer the tax a couple of years. But the big carrot that they're dangling is if they keep the money in that investment and the syndication keeps their opportunities on investments for at least 10 years, the appreciation on that replacement property can become totally tax-free when it's sold eventually down the road. So that, in the right circumstances, if there's an investor and likes the marketplace, likes the investment, and is not going to need that cash for 10 years, per se, and is okay with that investment sitting there for 10 years and thinks the appreciation is going to be there, then that can definitely make sense. But, I, you know, obviously there's a couple, there's other requirements and things and hurdles, but that's, I think, probably one of the big things that an investor needs to look at is what's that time, 10-year time frame look like? Yeah, I think the ozone works really well for, we've seen it like, it's okay, one uh, syndication investment exits, and I don't have other ways to defer taxes. I'm going to invest in another syndication that's like an uh, opportunity zone. We see that a lot in kind of failed or partially failed 1031 exchanges. So someone tried to do a 1031, but something happened. It didn't work out as planned. Now I have this gain. I could still defer the opportunity zone. I think one of the, I have a couple of the bigger plays here that we see with clients is sale of businesses. So you have a doctor or you have a, you know, an attorney selling their practice and for those, for the most part, you can't really 1031 exchange. So Opportunity Zone is a great way to defer the taxes on that or stock transactions as well on a similar note. Something that we've experienced, and you mentioned a failed 1031 exchange, is sometimes we've had people sort of in the process of trying to do a 1031 exchange and maybe they're getting close to their deadline and then they're not sure that it's going to work out or not. And then an Opportunity Zone pops up. And one of the things that that I understand they can do is go ahead and cancel the 1031 exchange, take the gains. And now what sort of window do you interpret that they have to then reinvest in that opportunity zone? I think this is one of those where you say, if you ask a a couple different CPAs, you'll get a bunch of different answers, right? So I think it, it depends, but I think the way we typically look at it is that 180 day period for the opportunity zone investments starts at the date of the failed 1031, because that's the date that triggers the actual gain, right? Prior to me failing a 1031 exchange, I was still in this transaction where I'm trying to defer the tax. But yeah, that's kind of a difficult call. And I think you'll get different answers depending on which CPA you ask. So the best person to ask is as an investor, right? The best person to ask is your CPA because they're going to be the one that's going to have to be comfortable signing off on the return with that transaction. It's a tough game to play. And I don't know, I'm trying to remember how long do you have to identify a property to close on a property in 1031 exchange? Is it 1031, you have 45 days to identify and 180 to close on it. You know, 45 is part of the 180, obviously, but 
Yeah. You could play the game if your CPA signs off on it of having that 1031 up to 170 days and then cancel it. And now you have another 180 days to find an opportunity zone to invest in. Like Amanda said, that's just one of those things that's like... Yeah hasn't really been tested to our knowledge, yeah. you know, so it's kind I'm of not, like, I'm not saying, of... I'm not saying, Hey, everybody go do that. I'm not saying that <laughs> talks to talk to your own. Well, tax we're all saying run, run to the back of the room and, and do your own ozone, uh, failed 1031 and ozone investment right now. Yeah, no, that's not what I'm suggesting. <laughs> all right. So can you, are there any recent tax reforms on passive real estate investments that individuals can adapt their investment strategies in response to these changes or have things been fairly static since? What, 2017 that's a great was when question. The big... Yeah, I thought that's a great question. I mean, for I specifically for passive investors, I really can't think of much in terms of tax law changes. Obviously, for all investors, um, the the more significant change from 2022 to 2023 is the reduction of bonus depreciation. So in 2022, we had 100% bonus depreciation versus now fast forward to 2023 tax return year. Bonus is now at 80%, um, which is not the end of the world. It's still really great. For decades, we've just had no bonus. To even continue to have 80% bonus is, it usually results in a pretty significant tax savings when it comes to real estate investments, and especially for syndications, because we're talking about larger numbers that the tax benefits are we're seeing are still. The thing that comes to my mind is it's been pretty status quo for the last couple of years. And I say that all political commentary aside, but the president and his team, they've various times the last two or three years, they've tried to, they put out proposals that they want to change, drastically change certain things with respect to real estate or taxes and stuff. And for whatever reason, things haven't passed yet or not going to pass, who knows. But so that's why I say it's stayed more or less a static quo, but they keep, they keep bringing it up and keep talking about it. So some next day, keep on the radar because obviously that could change a month from now for that matter. Yeah. It's always, I always tell people it's important to remember that a lot of these members of Congress and the Senate all own real estate. Yes, uh, And so it's yes. always, as much as they may get on TV and be talking heads about the evils of tax dodging real estate investors, a lot of them are tax dodging real estate investors. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a pejorative term at all. So what are some common tax pitfalls that passive investors should avoid when they're investing in real estate syndications? Um, well, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a pitfall, but I think we see this a lot and especially with our syndication clients and you get investors coming back two months after the K-1s issued, but just make sure that you are investing in the name slash entity slash ID number that you want to invest in. And that when you get a K-1 that it shows the same, reflects the same information that it's supposed to. It's just, it sounds like a silly thing, but it's one of those things that you see it get, it gets overlooked so often that it's, it is some worth mentioning for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when you get your K-1, take a look at it. Don't wait until October to open it up and realize, oh man, that should have been in my 401k's name. Somehow it should have been my name that I got to pay taxes on it. I think another, I think common, I don't know if that's, again, it's not a pitfall. We have investors who invest in syndications and when we're doing tax projections, they'll say, oh, I'm expecting $30,000 from this particular syndication. So help me factoring in how much taxes I have to pay. It's really important for, for investors to understand that when you get a distribution from the syndication, it does not automatically mean that is taxable income. Like we said earlier in, in our podcast that frequently what happens is you'll get cash distributions, but on the tax return side for the K-1, you might show tax losses. So this is something where you have the investors go back to the sponsor and say, okay, was this just distribution or was this some kind of a taxable event? So just getting an understanding that just because you got money distributed does not always translate into, I have to pay taxes on this. I think a couple, I mean, another thing that comes to my mind is this surprises investors sometimes too, is if you're investing in syndications or buying assets in multiple states, uh, you may be getting various state K-1s and you may or may not have a requirement to file state tax returns. So that'll be something to discuss with your CPA ahead of time as well, just they're not always do you have to follow the state K-1s. There's some thresholds or some materiality you may want to talk about with your CPA, but something to be aware of. Don't be shocked if, you know, it's investing in six states and all of a sudden you get six K-1s that go along with your regular K-1. Gotcha. All right. Last question, partly because I want to hear your experience and also so I want people to understand that we're not talking about this abstractly. We're, not, we're talking about this from your personal experience, but you guys are, you guys have been LPs and 
real estate syndications yourselves before. What are some of the things that you've seen from a tax savings perspective that have perhaps surprised you? And then lastly, are there any, do you have any advice for someone who is looking to invest with a sponsor about how to properly vet the sponsor or the deal? I think, yeah, I'll touch on the surprise one. I think it comes down to making sure you have your line of communication open with your personal CPA. On the negative side, surprises are sometimes passive investors hear the sponsors talk about all these great tax benefits of investing in real estate syndication, and they are anticipating a huge refund um, because they're just thinking, wow, I'm going to get $100,000 of write-off, therefore I'm not paying taxes on my W-2 income or my business income. And that may or may not be true. Right. So you as the investor have to do some planning with your personal CPA to get ahead of the game and figure out how or what are some things I can do to make sure I maximize my tax savings. So just because the syndication gives you the loss doesn't automatically mean you can utilize it. There's still going to be some effort needed on your part for the tax planning. I think that's the biggest surprise. I think on the flip side, we also do have investors who are not aware that the syndication losses can benefit them because they have other taxable passive income, whether through their own properties that they've held for many years, or we have physicians who invest in other medical facilities that are generating lots of passive income. So even though they're passive with respect to the syndication, those losses are being able to offset some of their income from other passive sources. So for that, sometimes like a welcome surprise. And I, I think in terms of vetting for those investors out there, maybe on the newer end or just not sure how to go about it, I think a couple of things that come to my mind is Understand, obviously, who the sponsor team is, who the syndicators are. Seems like a silly and easy thing to do, but go and Google their name and type fraud after the name for an extreme example. And just kind of, I don't know, you never know what's going to pop up, but definitely. SEC, that's another one. Yeah. John Smith and SEC. We want to make sure they're not in trouble. Do your background, background search on the syndicators. That's really important. You don't have to be a, you are not maybe a real estate pro, but understand the marketplace you're going, they're going to be investing in to some extent. And are you comfortable with the time horizon? Is it a five-year-old? Is it a 10-year-old? Is it, are they buying more than one property? Are they diversifying? Do you, all those kind of things where it's, you got to understand the investment. And some of these syndications are going to be straightforward. It's going to be 70% profit goes to the LPs and 30% goes to the sponsor team. Some are going to be four layers of that. And you just got to, again, you don't have to be an expert, but you got you should be comfortable and understand it enough to have a conversation about it and show it to your CPA and make sure they understand it because sometimes people are, maybe they're more on the, I don't know, simple, simple side of things. And the idea of investing in something that has five layers of a waterfall provision that just gives them a headache thinking about it. And if that's the case, then that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's- yeah. you gotta, Investors are reading that. <laughs> yeah. You just gotta, you gotta be comfortable with what you're investing in. Obviously it's your money and you've earned it. You wanna make sure you protect it as best you can. Yeah, we, we have a pretty, our syndication, we have a pretty simple, we just basically, we have an equity split that basically happens after we've paid back the preferred return. And that's pretty much it. And I'm, I'm mystified by, I don't mind the waterfalls at all. I kind of like sometimes when they've got them, cause it shows a sort of a target alignment of interest. They've got to hit certain performance targets for them to get paid, but I'm with you. It makes my head hurt a lot of the time. And I don't really like investing in things that make my head hurt. And the other thing that you bring up is that how important it is to vet the sponsor. And I almost tell people it's more important for you to vet the sponsor than it is for you to vet the deal. Because yeah. chances are the reason you're investing passively in this stuff is because you don't know much. You're not an expert in this. So don't expect to become an expert in real in multifamily syndication or mobile home parks or self-storage. Look for an operator who's the expert and who has a good track record and a good reputation. Start there. And then, yeah, look at the market, dig into the market a little bit. And if the market gives you the heebie-jeebies, don't invest. All right. Amanda and Matt, thank you so much for sharing with our audience today. You've got your book, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Investor. We will put that link in the show notes. But if our audience wants to reach out to you and find out more about you, where would be the best place for them to do that? Um, I think our website is likely the best place. We have a lot of great free resources people can download. We have a tax savings toolkit that has a lot of great information and also includes a, a assessment. I think one of the questions we get a lot from investors is like, how do I know if I'm overpaying in taxes? 
So we created an assessment that allows people to go through a series of questions on their own and arrive at kind of what their their grade is going to be. And I think as a result, it gives people an opportunity to see what are some of the areas where they could improve on with respect to tax planning. Um, so yeah, keystonecpa.com is the best place. And for anyone who's looking for kind of daily tax tips, the best place to find me is on Instagram as Amanda Han CPA. And I'm on there every once in a while when she adds me to her videos. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you guys today and thanks for sharing. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.